and welcome to Dark Natter, the podcast where we slice, dice and dissect your favourite works of dark fiction. I'm John Richter, as usual, and in today's episode I am delighted and honoured um, to be joined by Mark Tilbury. And I should say, actually, before I hand over to you, Mark, to introduce yourself, this is a first for Dark Natter because it's the first time that a resident of the Hall of Pain has actually appeared on the show. So brilliant. Quite an honour. Would you like to introduce yourself, Mark? Yeah, OK. Um, I've been writing pretty much all my life, but not until recently, maybe 2015, I started um, pushing out stuff towards Amazon self-publishing. My first two books were self-published on Amazon. Then I got picked up by Bloodhound for my third novel and The Abattoir of Dreams, and they went back and republished the first two. And then I totally, I think I had seven books published with Bloodhound. Yeah, I um, then I, I left Bloodhound and uh, went back to indie indie writing and I've just finished my fourth novel since then so I've done 11 and uh, thrown two, two away so I've really done 13. <laughs> well yeah it's interesting actually to speculate when you've written x number of books in reality I suspect this is true but most writers they've they've really written a few more but those ones just ended up in the bin for whatever reason yeah. but I've got a couple of them as well yeah like sad sort of orphans or whatever you'd call them and, and yeah it, it's I guess to explain a brief story of how we have met as it were is yeah we've both had a stint as, as on Bloodhound as a publisher as, as you know been label mates in effect and yeah. actually when um well I still am with Bloodhound I have one coming out with them that uh, will, will be out uh, by the time this episode is aired but when I Bloodhound did like a, a, a little offer for its authors recently like last year sometime I think where mm-hmm. they, they basically said sort of as a, as a nice giveaway freebie, they were giving away a free copy of a book to all of the writers, which is a nice thing to do. Um, yeah. And yeah. I said, uh, well, you know, which one would you recommend? And, the, the, you know, the, the lady who sort of runs the company, Betsy, the founder, she said, oh, you should read Mark Tilbury. He's right up your street. So I got one oh. of your books for free. Completely failed to read it because I'm useless at, you know, you have the massive towering pile of to be read. Oh, I'm saying. Which is just a nightmare, the constant guilt and all that stuff. But then yeah. uh, we had a guest on the show, of, you know, going back a few months when we recorded with a lady called Donna, who is like a, a sort of a book influencer, a lovely person. And she recommended you as her pick for the Hall of Pain. So I thought, right, I must sort myself out and read one of Mark's books. And I did. I read The Abattoir of Dreams and thought it was brilliant. So it's oh, an honour to finally be interviewing you in, in person. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. And, there's, and as you say, there's another 10 for, to be ploughed through as well, because you've got a, a, a nice chunky collection. And I think, um, again, if I get my t- timings right, you've got a, a new book coming out that I think will have just been released by the time this episode is. Um, maybe if you want yeah. to, to talk about that briefly. Yeah, sure. Um, well, it's out on the 24th of June. Um, it is a self-published book, again, because I feel that self-publishing allows me to go where I want to rather than trying to fit in any kind of mm-hmm. restraint set by, you know, well, you know, um, yes. editors, guidelines and things. Um, it's really the story of um, two teenage boys who go to army cadets, but they never show up. And obviously nobody's seen them. And the father, he's a, he's a single parent, he's a widowed parent and... He's frantic with worry. And a few days later, he gets a a letter saying that I've got both your boys, Mr. Levitt. Uh, One of them must die and you choose. The East series of horrendous, I suppose you could call them forfeits, to keep the boys alive. And it's really the story of uh, how and why that happens. And I guess how far you're prepared to go kind of thing if if someone's life is alive. Yeah, it's it's pushing his... his, um, I suppose his love to the limits and see what he, he can endure in just to keep his boys alive. Yeah. Oh man. Well, sounds suitably macabre and I would expect nothing, nothing else. So that's the well, best of <laughs> luck with the book. I hope it sells really well. And it's really interesting. You mentioned, um, you know, the whole sort of publisher versus self publisher thing. 
Um, yeah. Which I, I know we're, we're digressing because we, we've got a we have a, a main topic for today's show, which we will get to shortly. But yeah, yeah that's a really interesting one because I've had a sim- similar experience to you. I had a couple of I've got seven books out, including the new one, two of which are self-published. And yeah. in, in my experience has been the self-publishing, I really enjoyed the complete creative freedom to do whatever I wanted and design, get me own cover designed and title the book whatever I wanted and sort of no interference. The flip side is I am not, I don't think I'm very good at self-promotion and I failed to sell many copies of those books. So it's, it is yeah. that trade-off, isn't it? Between the publisher's kind of promotional backing can be helpful, but you seem to have cracked it because your self-published books, have, have, you know, have loads of really, really positive reviews. Yeah, I, I have to give um, my girlfriend a lot of credit for that. She's very good with social media. So she, she's taught me a hell of a lot about how to how to go about it. But I think in just, um, you know, just being in groups and talking within groups and, mm. um, you know, I know Donna talks about the Annies and, you know, yeah, get a lot yes. of interest because, you know, they're fantastic. So <laughs> I find the whole thing... Um, pretty uplifting to be honest with you and I, I, I feel totally in control you know <laughs> no that's fantastic and yeah it is particularly I don't want to um, cast this accusation at you but I definitely am a, I can be a bit of a control freak so I do like it is nice to have the you know you don't have yeah. to sort of compromise on your vision I guess is the without yeah too yeah sure um, and it's worth clarifying for the listeners in case they didn't hear um, the, the episode where Donna appeared, the Annies are in effect a self-styled group of Mark Tilbury super fans who are such big fans that they have named themselves after Annie Wilkes from Misery. Uh, so at, at some point you may, Mark may disappear and um, sort of, I don't know, lose, <laughs> lose lose one of his legs. <laughs> Hopefully not. Yeah. Well, they'll, they'll have to find me in the Hall of Pain. That, yeah, we'll pr- don't worry. We'll protect you. We'll get it reinforced. We'll make sure the door is, you know, double yeah. leaded and uh, they can't get in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I um yeah, I, I do do love. I I found a lot of good people out there. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, that that's lovely. That's really really good. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting because you sort of if you not if you're newish to social media because I I wasn't even on Facebook or anything until 2017 and I got on it because um, mm. my publisher said, oh, what, you, what do you mean you're not on Facebook and Twitter? Get on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> yeah. So you're a bit like, oh, God, this, you know, everyone says social media is really toxic and it's going to be this bad experience. And I just haven't had a bad experience. I found it really nice. And most people, 99% of people, just really friendly and pleasant. Yeah. You know? Well, it's, it's exactly the same. I felt exactly the same. And I found I was, I was pleasantly surprised. Yeah. it's uh, there is a uh, There is an element of... Like I don't do, I'm going to say lots of really opinionated political things. Partly, no. you just don't want to upset anyone, do you? So I, th- I do get that if you were being more vocal about some of your, you know, opinions that may be controversial, that's probably where you head, you end up going down that route of arguing with people and getting criticised and insults flying around. But well, I think it's, it's yeah, relatively I mean, easy to dodge it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't don't get involved in that, but. Um... I, I can see how it is dividing people, shall we say? And yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I got my opinions, but you know, they're my opinions. Yeah, correct. And and, and the reason people are following the likes of you and me is because they hopefully because they want to read some dark fiction books rather than because they want to know who we voted for in the election. So I just, well, sort of, yeah. do you know what I mean? It, it yeah, probably isn't exactly. Necessary. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I I don't think that. Um, Anything that personal is is of interest to anyone. Really. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, yeah. Well, speaking of the Hall of Pain, we are, of course, here to follow our usual formula where our guest uh, pitches and nominates a recommended piece of dark fiction or a series or an artist. Um, yeah. And we discuss the work. Uh, and I act as the adjudicator to decide whether it is worthy of a place in the hallowed hall. Um, and as I always say to any uh, guests, um, just not that I'm saying, don't worry, it'll be fine. But we have let everything that's ever been pitched ever has always got in. So um, don't, 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 don't spread oh, too okay. much. Of a... <laughs> so we, we, it's, yes, because the quality of the pictures has always been so high, of course. Mm. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and Mark, of course, even though you are a, a resident of the Hall of Pain yourself, you are coming today with a pitch of a, a, a different pitch to, for someone who potentially might join you, but I'll, I'll let you uh, 
announce who you're who you're bringing today? Okay. Um, well, my pitch today is for uh, Sarah England. Um, she's apart from she's a fantastic author. That goes without saying. Um, she writes very very dark, generally occult terror books. Um, she goes where. A lot of people wouldn't go, um, exposing a lot of things that are true, but, br you know, bringing them into fiction. Um, yeah, she, she's she got a very, very good way of drawing you into the book, you know, so you're actually, you feel, you forget you're reading her books. Yeah, you feel so, you become immersed in the story. Yeah, you become, in, yeah. Yeah, and you sort of, it, they're books that leave you feeling you know, when you finish a book, well, when I finish a book, I generally forget about it. But when I read Sarah's books, I I don't forget about it. I think about it. And, you know, that that's the mark of a of a good author. And um, apart from she's a very, very um, astute lady, she's somebody that should be in the Hall of Pain because I'm in the Hall of Pain, and Sarah would help definitely help get me out of the Hall of Pain. <laughs> She'd be like a useful partner in crime. By the same yeah, way. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And she she's got some excellent books out there. And uh, the 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 book I would like to sort of promote would be uh, Babalenka, but I'm never quite sure how to pronounce that, and I've never asked because it's rude. It's, it's a good point, though, actually. I have so, so yeah, I read Babalenka as my sort of prep for this show, and I'm really glad you because I haven't heard of Sarah, so I'm really so thank you for the recommendation because the book is great. I loved it. Um, yeah, but, she's yeah, brilliant. I'm going with Babalenka as pronunciation. Let's 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 put our stake our reputations on it yeah well that, that's <laughs> babalenka is uh, the way i would pronounce it but sometimes i've had many many of things like uh, not so much but um pronunciation but um spellings of the titles of abattoir is many and varied <laughs> oh god that that word it catches me out every single time that it's all you know little red underline oh damn it i've got the b and the t the wrong way around yeah, yeah the, the pronunciation know. thing is worse isn't it because there's you, there might be spell checks and so on but there's no well you can find out how to pron pronounce things but usually in a you know in a forum such as this it's too late once you've committed it to recording so fingers crossed well, we're okay even even um, whoever done the um, formatting for it spelled it wrong. Oh, you're joking! No, I'm not. God, it no. is. A, I'm gonna right here. We go. I'm gonna really embarrass myself now. I think abattoir is one b two t's, or have I got that the wrong way around? I've written it so many times. You're definitely right. Oh God, that's a relief. <laughs> well, that is. Yeah, I mean, you must have had to correct that about a thousand times. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's really I'll... funny. It's in a lot of reviews, and it's like, well, you don't tell people that are being nice they spelt the name wrong. But yeah. exactly right, no, you're spot on. Uh, but mm. yeah, no. So Babalenka, we, we'll well, what we'll do is, um, we'll give a spoiler, a potential spoiler warning, just in case we cover some elements of spoilers. We will obviously try not to, because we, we'll talk in broader terms about the plot without giving away the specific twists. But um, yeah, you never know. And, and if you are interested in um, Sarah's work, then, of course, feel free to pause this show, go and buy it, read it, and then come back. So, yeah, um, I guess Sarah's books, before we get into the specifics of Babalenka, um, she, I think she writes under the name S.E. England, if I've got that Yeah, she right. does, yeah. Um, and, she, yeah, she's a UK-based writer of, of sort of, I think all of her books are what you call kind of occult fiction. Um, yeah, they've got that thread through them, yeah. Yeah, and I think she has nine books, which are available in, you know, in bookstores, in paperback, yeah. on your email, yeah. and, and so on. Uh, and yeah, she, she seems to have been active for, for, for a while. Um, lots of, even just if you look at the titles and the kind of covers of some of the books, they all look suitably kind of atmospheric and intriguing uh, things. Yeah. Like, there's one called, uh, I think, Father of Lies, The Owl Men. I like the title of that. Tan yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, some some really interesting stuff, and I think she has a new one out literally earlier this year. Uh, again, called uh, called Masquerade. Masquerade, yeah. So definitely worth looking out for. But but Babalenka is is your favourite one, is it, Mark? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I like it's like all books. I like them in varying degrees, but it's the one I kind of thought about a lot more afterwards. I think, and yeah, I. I, I find it very hard to name favourite books, but Babalenka's one that really struck home. 
yeah. yeah and like you say that idea that a story that stays with you afterwards and you kind of you it sticks sticks in your mind gets its kind of claws in for yeah yeah it's hard yeah. to explain and quantify exactly why that happens with some with some works but i um i had a recent one i play a lot of video games so we sometimes talk about video games on this show played a game called disco elysium and i literally i've been it's just on me my every day finished it about a week or so ago keep thinking about it keep googling it keep listening to the soundtrack <laughs> from it. it do you know what i mean it's just kind of yeah. stuck in my head for whatever strange reason but um but babalenka is it, it, let's see if i can summarize the plot in effect it's it's very cleverly written really it, it, and yeah. parallels with your own work which we'll come back to perhaps but it's got this thing of flitting between a present day story and the past but which in, is i like that yeah yeah and again in, in your own work abattoir of dreams it definitely had a strong element of that which uh, yeah yeah which, which was really effective in, in well, the instance, past always affects the present you know so if you go back if you start why is this happening i do like stories that go back to explain that yeah. Whereas yeah. some people more like a more linear thing, but I, I do like things that chop about, as long as you don't get lost. <laughs> yeah, and, and it, can, it yes, because it, 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 in some ways it, it became quite fashionable, I guess, at a point in time to have these, you know, Tarantino-esque kind of fractured narratives that are jumping back and forward. And yeah. Sometimes yeah. you can get books that maybe overdo it a little bit and you, yeah, you're sure. like, what oh, what year is this now? What order is this? But I think in, in certainly in your book, and in Babalenka, that it, it isn't confusing. It's very clear where, you know, where yeah. the action is taking place. In Babalenka, yeah. there's, it's not just the main character who is a, um, starts off, she's a young girl and she has taken to Germany because she's of German heritage. I think in effect her mum's mum is mm -hmm. a German woman who has died and they have to go there for the funeral. And that's where the story kind of takes, takes with a really brilliant opening scene uh, that I'll, I'll come back to in a minute. But then we get n not just the girl growing up. So you get that kind of childhood and then a, sort of young adult life but also we get these flashbacks to the life and childhood of the grandma and set in like 1890 yeah. so it almost had that element of being like historical fiction in a way which is really yeah sure yeah 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 it's, it's it's got all all of that and um i think it's sort of it's tied to what a, a sort of belief of mine anyway that that evil powers have always controlled the world you know it, it it's a sort of story that speaks. Could I say I? It's something I would write if I could write. I can't write yeah, that kind yeah. of way. Um, but you know, money and power being used to control the the world the way, as as I believe that wars are manufactured rather than random politicians arguing and suddenly there's a war. I think that yeah, it's a much yeah. deeper thing and the deeper evil that runs beneath all that. And um, in Babylonia, she sort of <clears throat> explores all of those those angles to it, um, and that there's a sort of very clear message that although the, that she's she doesn't want her granddaughter to to suffer, yeah, be the same. She she wants yes, to break yes. that cycle. Yeah, it, it's and I'm really fascinated by by that that idea, and you touched on there about the sort of evil undercurrents sort of lurking beneath the world and, and, and you know alternate takes on historical events and was the truth as it was presented to was really the truth or was something else going on and I, yeah this, this might sound a bit weird but there's an element of so I suspect to be honest I suspect you're absolutely right and the vast majority of wars to an extent as we've kind of found out in more recent years where at least things arguably have got a bit more transparent they're always about money or oil or well, yeah, you, you know yeah. anti communist yeah. it, 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 there's always some pretty nefarious motivation for why countries go to war there's, there's never we, we you know, the UK the US are always portrayed in the UK and US media as if we're the good guys and we're you know the world the world police and we're you know trying to clean up the and it's just it's just bollocks in it usually it's over it's for financial gain or or whatever well um, it is i mean the you know, I mean, without going getting sidetracked too much, you know, there was uh, an awful lot of American money funding the Nazis, you know. Yeah, it, 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 and, and even, as you say, we won't go too far down the rabbit hole, but like I went to Hiroshima recently, I went to visit Japan because I love Japan, I've been there a couple of times, yeah. I went to the museum, yeah. and you and you realise that arguably or potentially or seemingly 
fa factually, it would seem th the reason that the atom bomb was dropped was not sort of oh we need to we we must do this to end the war and it's uh, you know sacrificing lots of people for the greater good. That wasn't really true at all. They dropped nah. it because they'd spent loads of money on it <clears throat> and they had to show some sort of return on their investment. Otherwise, they'd under you know they they'd come in for political criticism for wasting all this money on the project. So they thought oh, we best drop it then. So it, there's no well, good yeah. guys. There's no good and good. No, bad there's at all. there's not. You know, even when you go go deeper than that, Pearl Harbor wasn't what it seemed really. I don't think. So. Yeah. So, so, but what's but, interesting about the Babalenka approach and, and that kind of fictional take on it is, instead of it focusing on the almost kind of depressing truth of that, it sort of spins it what to me is a more fun way, which is, and the underlying evil is not necessarily just capitalism and greed. The underlying evil is actual evil and, you know, satanic uh, dark stuff, which makes well, it yeah. more yeah, compelling, exactly. maybe. Well, yeah, I mean, that, it's the way um, Babalenkas is used by them evil powers. You know, it's it's not that she was necessarily evil. It's that they, they use you. They... they how can I, I can't try to put it in modern terms? You know, it's like she's is, a resource. That yeah, they, is such and such an evil person, or have they been used? And the more you write and the more you research, you realise that we're we're not living in a world we think we are. Yeah, oh, yeah, totally. And and there's this idea that you know, scratch the surface away, and there's some pretty dark stuff festering yeah, underneath it. Yeah, um, and that. That, but this, I've only read one of series books, but by the sound of it, that kind of permeates all of them as a bit of a as a bit of a theme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I um I I shudder to think, and I I I previously would never have um been drawn to books that involved witchcraft, you know, and things mm -hmm. like that, because I'm sure they they exist in every bit as much as you know the. But my 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 sort of attitude has been slowly turned completely upside down from where I was a few years ago interesting and so I I feel yes I'd read and read about all the you know the Salem witch trials and all yeah. that but I wasn't sure what that was but I'm I'm pretty certain that, that there is genuine forces of good and evil out there now I'm pretty certain of that no, and I, I think that a lot of things that were painted as evil like witchcraft you know yeah. bad nasty witches it's all an inversion. Yeah. They're trying to shut down what we can really do. Do you see what I mean? The yeah, powers uh, and it's not again. It's not a subject I am very uh, well versed in at all. But you know, this whole like the word paganism can be used wrongly as synonymous with yeah. Satanism, and can be that you know, and therefore it seems evil and bad. But paganism yeah. really is all that kind of nice, natural, earth-based you know, kind of yeah. at one with nature. And again, I'm, I'm completely getting that wrong. And yeah. Who knows well, it's, it's me. But almost it's not, like, yeah. sorry, it's almost like no, it's okay. the, every effort made by the so-called powers that be are trying to keep us from the truth. Yeah. So the yeah. truth is a sort of like inverted as an evil when it's the other way around. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it is, ah, oh, you could go, there's so many kind of layers to this conversation really, but it's like we've, We've settled. We, we said at the start, oh, we won't be. We won't get too political, and now, it, now we have. But never mind. It's okay. Oh no. no it's, well, I I do sort of. Um, it's not really because of any other any other reason, but I I do know Sarah quite well through not personally, but I do know her quite well, and I know a lot of her private thoughts. You know, and you know to say. They come across in her writing, I guess. That's yeah, what, that's yeah. What all she's writers a woman do. of my own heart. Yeah, she really does. Um, she does get it. But the, 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 I mean, it's and it's good for people to challenge the status quo. It, it feels to me like where we are in twenty twenty one is there's no real counterculture anymore. There's no protest really. There's no punk mm. movement. It's all like everyone's just accepted capitalism, and that's the best we're going to get. And this this will do. And it's all but it's masquerades as a meritocracy where if you work hard you, you rise to the top and make loads of money but actually that's kind of bollocks it tends to be yeah. if you get a massive you know inheritance you're obviously on a much better footing 
and, and then even the people who are self-made, you know, billionaires through modern tech companies. I mean, you know, they're usually exploiting people in workforces in other countries and overseas labor or they're not paying people proper minimum wage and they're using apps. And then, you know, for, to, on top of that, they then try to pretend that they're really cool and trendy and young people love them. Yeah. And just that all makes me a bit, you know, want to puke. So it, yeah, it is so- good to challenge this stuff, I think. Yeah, it was something to aspire to because um, everything that seems to, to glitter these days is, is corrupt, you know, And but, yeah. but everyone seems to want the brand new Merc. They want the yeah. lifestyle yeah. and it's not a lifestyle to aspire to, you know. So she's very much into a lot of things behind that. And, you know, she she has worked for the pharmaceutical industry and she, yeah. she has... Um, I believe she trained as a psychiatric nurse, but I might be wrong. Oh, so she's got, got very, 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 no, sorry, very Mike, good. I was just going to say, yeah, she probably has, for a couple of reasons, then some big insights. One into sort of yeah, nefarious yeah. global corporate practices, and one into psych- psychology and the human brain as well. You know, because of her views, which I wholeheartedly hold. You know, she she's not really on Facebook anymore, so it's quite hard. Oh, for her to prom- promote her books, you know, because she can't really do it very well on there. It's, it's very, as you say, back, back to our earlier thing, it is, and speaking about the, yeah, the ills of social media and t- tech, you, you are, as a writer, particularly if you're sort of self-published, you, you, you're lost without it. And I suppose we've got to give it its credit. At least these platforms like Amazon, Kindle, Direct Publishing, they've enabled a, a route to market for a lot of people whose voices might not have been heard. So... I suppose, yeah. we should, I suppose we should be thankful for that bit. <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose they, they're getting a little bit more draconian. They wouldn't um, advertise my last book because of the cover, Amazon. Oh, really? What You, you had like a dark, sinister cover and they sort of... Well, it's it. just a, a young guy crawling along a country road. I mean, it's not really... Um, That's weird. I, you one? know, it's not somebody with their head hanging off and I, I uh, it's not suitable for their, their type of... So they're becoming more and more, we're going to tell you what to do. Uh, that's that's not good. And also, I do worry then, because my one of my self-published ones, I've literally got like a severed hand hanging out of a bin bag. So I wonder how long it won't be long before that gets deleted then, but never <laughs> mind. <laughs> well, they even banned one for just having a black cover with a gold lock on it. Eh? That's weird. Well, I know, but I, I do worry when they, they become very dominant and as they are in the marketplace yeah. they'll start becoming very you can do what we want you to do you know well, well we're already in that place aren't we of like we have anti-monopoly laws and competition you know pro-competition laws which <clears> is obviously the lifeblood of the aforementioned capitalist kind of model but yeah there's states can't really stop these big global mega corporations because they've transcended state boundaries they're everywhere yeah. they're globally dominant and it's yeah. they don't really care what one little poxy government is going to throw we're going to increase corporation tax they're like not bothered we just won't pay it anyway yeah exactly yeah, yeah. so it is quite a, a worry but yeah she's um I believe she's on Telegram now, trying, you know, promoting her books. Oh well, but... uh, hopefully she's hopefully she's able to still have some success, and we are definitely happy to promote her on here because the Babalenka is a great book. Um, yeah, I was going to say there was one aspect of the book that I'll swerve in slightly to a different topic, but that again was certainly a parallels with your work was this element mm. of of kind of child abuse. So yeah. you know, sort of not just the flashbacks to childhood, but also flashbacks to a troubled childhood. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I guess that's a that's something you know. You talked earlier about things you couldn't write about. You, you, it's interesting to read other people do them, but you put. I I think I would. I've never had that in my books because it's you know I'm lucky. It's not something I experienced, and yeah, I just think I wouldn't be able to portray it convincingly. But both you and Sarah do a great job of of you know presenting these really harrowing things, but in a sensitive, realistic way, not in a gratuitous way. Yeah, yeah, it's a very delicate balance I think um I think that Sarah gets it just right personally I think that um for me there was an awful lot in abattoir dreams that I I took out you know because books write themselves as you probably know yeah and there was a lot of stuff that that I took out so yes it is a fine balance but I, I think she gets it right yeah, no, definitely, and and it and it adds certainly it gives you know creates the sympathy for the main protagonist, and you end up you really hate certain certain characters in the books to the point where it succeeds in 
in effect, she at one point is is um, as a witch, almost like a trainee, trainee in witchcraft and these dark satanic powers. She's willing, a, you know, a hex onto a person. But at that point, mm. I was like, yeah, good, hex him. Yeah. He dies. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I think it's a mark of a a good writer, which Sarah is, is to actually evoke responses in readers. You. You want them to sort of laugh and cry and throw the kingdom. You want them to do all them things. Yeah. And, you know, and also rooting for the good guy to the point. I mean, I've I've had people say some pretty atrocious things they want to do to my characters. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's, but that's, I, have I to guess, not sort any... of remind, remind myself, but not them, but remind myself <laughs> that they're not real. <laughs> yeah, and it's a compliment, isn't it? It's great if yeah. people are like, your villain is such yeah. a scumbag, I'd like to torture him. You're like, yes, good. Yeah, well, in the same way you say about Hex and someone, you think, yeah, go for it. You know, take his bloody eyes out. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely right. And, and you get to, mm. you know, this is one of the pleasures of writing is you get to create these horrible vill- villains and then do nasty things to them and give them their comeuppance. But, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I so I don't know quite where these characters come from, but I I do know they 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 are really out there. They're really yeah. out there. Uh, well, I said in the episode where we inducted you into the Hall of Pain, your villain um, I've forgotten his name, uh, Carver, detect the detective inspector Carver, or, or, or the police. Yeah. Like, what? An, oh my god! I hated that bloke, and I normally like the villains, but I couldn't stand him. Yeah, um, I know he he didn't. I, no, he didn't have one redeeming thing, did he? Yeah, scumbag, in a good, but in a good way. Good, great villain. Um, th- yeah. There was one, one other thing I was going to mention um, in the book, which had just a very small detail, but it's so, and again, parallels with your writing, was that very convincing, because I'm Northern, obviously I'm from Wigan, and it was this really convincing depiction of pretty grim, depressing poverty, you know, set 1970. Yeah. I wasn't born in the 70s, born in the 80s, but it was mm. still, you know, my upbringing was still had elements of being mired in that sort of pretty grim northern land. It's not just the north, it's any, you know, any town, any city has got the kind of po- poor, poverty stricken aspects. And it, it felt like it captured that really convincingly. Like yeah. the, the girl, when she went to move in with her parents and they were feeding her like toast with treacle on it. And I'm like, what the toast with treacle on it? What's that? Who eats that? Mm, yeah I think well that's another thing I think she does well is she can paint the pictures very well as well totally you know totally. so you actually again as I come back to you rather than reading a book you're actually living a book you're in the yes. book yeah. and, and, and there was a bit um, about I think she used this a couple of times it, maybe to draw a parallel between the protagonist in the 70s and the grandma in the 1890s but they were there were scenes where they were in in the company of adults who are much older than them and, you know, treating them like patronising them and treating them like little kids. And there was that stilted meal where it's like you sat at the dinner table and everyone's very silent and you're not allowed to speak because you might offend your granddad. And they they were sort of chomping away on the food. And she goes into great detail of the, like the horrible sound of this slobbery saliva drench. And I was like, Oh God, that sort of sounds that really compelling and visceral. Yeah. Yeah. I, I first sort of saw that kind of writing with um, Stephen King when he was describing quite trivial things, but actually they they got to you. Yeah. <laughs> they sort of got right mm. inside you and made you feel like you're going to puke. Yeah. That- very, very simple things. And, um, yeah, I first first sort of recognised that style of, I sort of call it the nitty-gritty, you know, the little, little things that most yes. people wouldn't really consider they would sort of bypass that the meal would be the meal or people would get dressed and they would just get dressed or but some writers can actually turn that into an experience rather than the passage of writing brilliant and I, really poor, yeah and it's yeah. like you get the set and it's it, in some ways it's like writing 101 but it's easy to forget to do it is this you know make sure you describe the sounds the smells the sights that don't just yeah. you know he got you know he ate a meal you could go you can go to town on the sound that his mouth made while he was yeah pumping away or the dentures slipping a bit <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, yeah well and then there's another thing there about the um 
so it, obviously it's not the fault of older people that they are older and have to wear dentures and maybe dribble a bit when they're eating or whatever. But equally, <laughs> from a child's perspective, those are the sort of things that impact you. Like you remember when you're a kid going to your grandparents' yeah. house and it kind of smelled a bit funny and you know, it's all a bit weird and old age is a bit scary to kids that she yeah, captured I, that brilliantly as well. I mean, it, it reminded me slightly of when we used to visit my old nan when I was a kid, you know, and I'd always have to kiss her on the cheek and try and avoid the hairs that were sprouting out. <laughs> it sounds very familiar. We, it's funny what people call their grandparents as well, because there's no settled thing. There's You use the word nan, and then some people mm-hmm. say gran, and then some, in my family, for whatever weird reason, we didn't have a nan or a gran. We had big grandma and little grandma, but big grandma oh. was, she was about five foot two and little grandma was about four foot ten. <laughs> Neither <laughs> of them were big, but one was just bigger than the other one. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Various stages of little. Yeah, except, yeah, little and littler would have been a better yeah. description. But, yeah. um, and, and then, yeah. of course, you can use that um, that really effective, evocative description if she, when she then turns that to full-blown paranormal stuff. Like that mm. is again a bit of a spoiler, I guess. Um, but there's an, a bit where a sort of an apparition, or you know, is it the ghost of a grandma or whatever, first makes its appearance, and it's like this corpse shambling out of the wardrobe. Yeah, but, and we've seen, you know, a ghost or that sort of thing depicted umpteen times. It's not that it's not a new concept. We've seen it in films, and we've seen it done well in some films. And yet she managed to describe it in a way that made it feel still quite frightening and impactful with the, you know, broken neck or whatever. And Yeah. Well, that's, that's the whole, that's the whole thing. That's, that's my biggest, the biggest praise I can give any writer is if they actually can describe something in such a way that A, it's got a slightly different angle to it, but B, you, you, you believe it, even though you might actually think, this can't be happening you know yeah, yeah. this is a this is not 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 a normal thing but people that can describe things in such a way that you what's the word you are you abandon all reason yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, there's a thing called suspension of disbelief isn't there and it's like that's the that's, word that's, that's, yeah, the, word. that's yeah. the skill it's like you know it can't possibly be true or you, you at least True in the conventional sense, you've never experienced. Some people have experienced ghosts and so on. I haven't, but um, mm. you, it, you're reading something that's clearly fiction and clearly didn't happen. But you're yeah. is not see. You're not seeing the the artist and the craft. You're just in the story, and you believe your brain yeah. believes that it's real while you're in there. That's yeah. What you say. Well, that's, that's a long time ago. I don't know. I can't remember who said it now, but it it was about writing and it was about. Um, you can have tools in the box to write, but, but the whole thing is just the story is the story. It's all about the story. And yes. if you can make the, the, the area, like you say, run down depressed areas or the yeah. eating with the grandparents, it, the story becomes real, even though it's not real. And that, that's, that's, for me, her greatest talent. No, most definitely. And um, we touched there on the kind of ghosts and the and, and, and mm-hmm. all the kind of witchcraft stuff and dark powers, Satanism, the occult. And that was, yeah. there was a, although your novel, Abattoir of Dreams, had, was ostensibly a crime thriller, you know, about a, a you yeah. know, corrupt policeman who gets his, you know, spoilers, we, we won't spoil the ending, what happens to, the, to <laughs> Inspector Carver. But um, th- there were elements of the paranormal in your work as well. Yeah. Um, and I, I suppose, I'm trying to phrase this into a question, maybe I'll just say a statement. It, it's nice to read books with paranormal stuff in because my yeah. experience of the publishing industry is that publishers don't want you to have paranormal stuff in your books and they try and encourage you to strip it out, which I think is sad yeah. because paranormal stuff is interesting and cool. And real. If you want to, yeah, there you go nice nice response but yeah i i also it's part of the reason i did want to go back to indie you know yeah. I'd, I'd done my my last book with bloodhound was me trying to write a what you call a bog standard psychological thriller mm. and i felt you know it was not really it it felt a bit forced it felt a bit not really sure what I'm doing with this. It, it wasn't um, 
I wrote another one, followed it, A Mind to Murder, and the same. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to go back to doing what I want to do. I think that's you know that you've got to do it. It's because you're not. You're not ultimately. The reason you're writing is because you you love writing and you want to write. So if you try, yeah. and, oh well, but I'm going to write this because I think this might be more mainstream or it might be more successful. I think yeah. I think it's just yeah. hiding to nothing, isn't it? Yeah, you start getting plot formulas. You know, A plus B yeah. equals C plus D, and and also. Um, I think Bloodhound were getting a bit twitchy at that time. They were very good to start with about paranormal in the books, but I think they were getting a bit twitchy about that. Um, which, which I can understand. I can understand why public, you know, their it, business it's marketing. stuff. Exactly. And and like my yeah. a different publisher, but my first publisher, I had, I ended up having to take out the paranormal element of that book. Yeah. And although yeah. it didn't it didn't sell particularly well anyway. I'm not going to say, oh, I told you so. It, that there's, a, there's different reasons why it didn't sell particularly well, or a bit of bad luck. But mm -hmm. I suspect removing that paranormal element did make it a more marketable book. So I think they were yeah. probably right. But equally, I preferred the old one with the paranormal bit in. So I kind of wish I'd just sort of stuck to my guns, maybe. But yeah, we'll go. Yeah, that's important because. I think ultimately writers write for themselves and then they hope other people might like it, you know, that's yeah, all. Yeah. Correct, correct. I mean, I don't sit down with a view in mind anymore. I just sit down with a view to do what I want to do, you know, and, and Sarah the same and, uh, you know, the good writers um, that I, I've read always want to do the same. I mean, Dean Koontz read, he wrote one of the best books I've ever read and he from the corner of his eye and you know it's all over the place with genres if you want yeah but yeah. but but so what what does exactly. it matter correct and, and and so that this is maybe partly linked to something we were talking about before we started recording about this podcast and the fact that it's dark fiction rather than horror necessarily is i, I yeah. get that there isn't a so like I write books in different genres. I've got like a cyberpunk one and a crime yeah. one and some horror ones. And you do get that criticism from people who are a bit like, oh well, you know, those all belong in different shelves in the bookshop, and maybe that's hampering your sales, John, because yeah. if you wrote stuck to one genre, then you, you wouldn't be confused. But there's an element of like, yeah, but I don't want to like, don't want to do that. I'll just well, prefer to mm. write what I want to write, and then if it's successful, great. And if it's not that successful, oh, oh well, never mind. Yeah, well, I. I I can't even remember. I don't want to quote people, but somebody I read a long time ago wasn't even an author. I think it was a songwriter. He said, "You've got to make your mind up whether the the, the what you're doing is about the books or the art, and it's always about the art." Yeah, good. Well said. Well, it's got to be. And, and actually, ironically, usually focusing on the art will probably lead to more success anyway because you're going to yeah. enjoy what you're doing and make something better in, in the first place. But yeah, of course. Yeah, I I um. Definitely subscribe to that. I, I'm well aware that probably 99% of authors are not going to live the high life. You know? yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I'm, I'm flitting, you know, on and off being an accountant to pay the bills. Yeah, I know. Like, yeah. Like, like I, 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 um, but to have sort of a, bo a body of work like yourself, like Sarah, like me, like, like yeah. plenty of other people, is more important than, than money in the bank. Because again, as we go back to that thing about the control we're brought up in, yeah. it's nothing to aspire to anyway. Yeah, ex you're exactly right. And, and you, you're spot on as well. The, the feeling you get from, don't get me wrong, it'd be great if I was selling millions of copies of books and having- Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> That'd be great, it's not gonna happen. But the main thing is yeah, I feel this sense of like, Ah, you know, whatever's happening at work and uh, whatever, any other aspect of my life, I can look at me, my little suite of books and be like, I'm proud of them. I'm dead happy about that. And that's the... Yeah, well, that's it. That's, that's precisely, I suppose you just, um, you're pleasing your soul, I guess, rather than trying to please the whole world, you know. Brilliant. That's so that, that's how, how I look at it. And I, I think... Um, there are plenty of fantastic writers out there the same and they'll, they'll never be majorly successful. But then I look at a lot of books without naming them that are majorly successful and I think, bloody hell, it's just all about the promotion because it yeah. ain't about yeah. the content. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would agree with that. And that's true for films and it's true in the yeah. video games yeah. and it's, it's true in any, any sort of artistic output that often yeah, of course it is. Is what equals the sales and... Fair play. I guess that's why marketing professionals, that's a skill set that, you know, that, mm -hmm. that they've got. Um, 
Well, that that might be a good note to, to do the, our sort of wrap up uh, summary. If uh, if you if you are able, Mark, to give us like a, a final summary pitch for Sarah England and Babalenka for the Hall of Pain. Okay, well, Babalenka is uh, a fantastic story. It spans generations. It absolutely uncovers the world of evil, the way that evil powers corrupt. It explores witchcraft. It's very dark. It's it's humorous at places. It does everything for me that a book should do. Sarah goes to places that most writers don't go to. And for me, as a, as a writer, that's a good thing. I think that she does that fantastically well. Um, and I, I guess um, the main thing, but the Babalenka, she doesn't want Eva to be caught in that trap herself. And it's a story that kind of examines the links between the past and the present and how they can affect. And finally, I would like to say that if I'm, well, I am in the Hall of Pain, if I wanted one person in there to keep me company, other than Stephen King, Sarah England would be the absolute perfect person psychologically, and she's she's just a, a genius. Yeah, oh, well, fantastic, fantastic pitch. And um, I obviously I'm in direct communication. The Hall of Pain actually is sentient, of course, so it has its own will. Uh, and it can communicate uh, telepathically with me. And I can confirm that uh, Sarah is definitely accepted, happily accepted into the Hall of Pain. Um, oh, good. And we'll, we'll, we're doing a bit of a rejig. You know, it, the place needs sprucing up a bit. It's looking a bit dingy and rotten. And we're starting to get a few complaints. Uh, you've um, got two craggy old gits like me and Stephen King. Yeah. Now you want something nice in there. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure the three of you have got cells. I mean rooms uh, next week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we can meet in the canteen. Uh, we need to put a canteen in. We, it hasn't got a canteen yet, so we'll uh, no, just got a, vend, well, a vending machine. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd, uh, I'd like Sarah England in there just to possibly also explain to me why I am psychologically bloody twisted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be nice to know, wouldn't it? It's like yeah. sometimes these, I always, you know, um, that trope in movies and things where there's like a creep, a kid who draws creepy drawings. Um, yeah. So when I was a kid, that was me. I used to draw all my like, heads on spikes and just monsters with claws and eyeballs hanging out. Did you, were you the same? Have you like, have you always been this way? If, if that makes sense. No, I, I would be very much, uh, the earliest memory I've got of having anything, and no, it wasn't twisted at all. It was reading the stories of <laughs> Noddy and Big Ears. <laughs> I had, yeah, he did play, and I had a bit of that. Yeah, and I looking at my dad at the dinner table and thinking in my head, and Big Ears is sitting there eating his <laughs> dinner, you know, stuff like that. But no, nothing, nothing really twisted, but I did sort of... Um, I did see a ghost and I saw some sort of things and, you know, I, it was a slow, slow thing, but I think it was more looking into dark stuff. It wasn't really as a, a child. And in my book, the child does start depicting very violent images and she paints really mm -hmm. clearly at four years old. So I've always been aware and fascinated by that, particularly child prodigies, you know, that could... Yeah. Come out of the womb and play bloody piano concertos. You know it's, that's kind of weird. I, Matt, there was a kid. I, I read something the other day where there was like a three-year-old kid who can speak multiple language. You know, it's like a men yeah. immense kid who's got like multiple languages and stuff. It's just some unbelievable. Like that yeah. must be a very strange existence. But so they'll they'll put put him through uh, him or her through school and then knock that out of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just ruin it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The school system will probably com convert them into a really mundane. Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really interesting and really interesting that you've had uh, paranormal experiences yourself because as I've mentioned earlier, I have not. So I am like the, yeah. if, if we, you know, I'm the scully to your moulder, I guess, in this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, it was it was a sort of a strange thing, but um, being alone on a, a long winding road, it was uh, very late at night and I see a hitchhiker 
but he wasn't maintaining his distance. He kept floating back towards me. And I can absolutely assure you, you're very lucky not to have seen one. <laughs> I'm going to say, by the sounds of it, that was a bit of a goosebumps moment, that, your description. Well, right. I think Fine. at my age and bloody fitness, it would have killed me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just for any ghosts who are listening, if you could try and limit your appearances to, you know, the, the, the younger people would be nice. Thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah, don't yeah. Don't to... don't don't give it to a sixty-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah. well, Mark, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, join us today for a chat. So it's been a massive pleasure. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, and it's been great to talk to you, John. Thank hey. you. And uh, you're, you're very kind. And if if the listeners wanted to seek out you and your work, is there any particular avenues that you'd prefer to be uh, sort of searched on or, or contacted through? Well, my all my all my books are on Amazon. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah I mean my my email address is marktilbury59 at gmail.com. That's where all people can brilliant. Um and there are all my social media links, but I haven't got a clue what they are. No, that's all right. People can just search it, seek it out for themselves. But yeah, as yeah you if say, you just put Mark Tilbury into Amazon, you find all my work. There is some bloke, isn't there, who's nicked your name, though? Some, like, corporate, ironically, given our earlier conversation, some, like, corporate business blooming self-help guru called Mark Tilbury as well. Oh, I've had plenty of emails asking for help. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, you're, you can give him the occult paranormal... Uh, I think he was he's a financial guru I said well I, I thought I could help people if they wanted to be bloody poor <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny so yeah just if anyone does google Mark Tilbury and gets surprised by a I don't know American sort of financial yeah guru, that's oh, I've had quite one. a lot of very long emails explaining their situations all very sad but it ain't me I won't get you out of it <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's kind of, that's quite funny. That's quite funny, but yeah, different different Mark Tilbury. This is the darkest. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, thanks again, Mark, and uh, yeah, we will well, thank you again. farewell, and uh, hopefully speak to you again one day. And enjoy enjoy your time in the Hall of Pain, of course. I certainly will with Sarah and Stephen King. That'll be fabulous. <laughs> Cheers, Mark. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, John. Ta da then. There you have it. That's another episode of Dark Matter in the can. And yeah, I sort of... You make a show like this and you think at some point I'm going to have a bad guest and it's going to all be a bit difficult. No, just not happened at all. Like every guest we've had on the show has been brilliant. And Mark was no exception. It was a lovely chat and lovely to listen back to it. And uh, yeah, thanks ever so much, Mark. And please do make sure you check out Mark's new book, which is called One Must Die and is available now on Amazon. Um, yeah, if you enjoyed the show, we, we hope you did, then please do leave us a five-star review. That would be really helpful so we can get, you know, more reviews. The algorithm goes, ooh, recommend that to some other people, and then we get more listeners and blah, 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 blah. So that would be really nice. Um, and if you want to speak to us, please get in touch. The best method is probably on Twitter, uh, where you can find us at dark underscore natter. And we will happily natter away with you about stuff. Otherwise, we will speak to you again in a couple of weeks for more murmurings of mayhem. Um, and in the meantime, look after yourselves. Don't have nightmares. Or if you must have nightmares, then make sure they're good ones. Ha 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 ha.